Coming up next is Captain Mike with the Boathouse TV Hi, show. Hi, welcome to the Boathouse. I'm your host, Captain Mike. Aw, oh, just once can't hurt. Once can't hurt. Just this once can't hurt. Just once can hurt. So pump it, don't dump it. For more information, call the Department of Boating and Waterways at 916-322-1771. Hi, welcome to the Boathouse TV Show. I'm your host, Captain Mike Whitehead, and presently I'm aboard the topsail catch, the Argus, operated by the Boy Scouts of America, Newport Sea Base, located here in beautiful Newport Beach, California. But today, we travel up to Burbank to give an interview with Roy Disney about his sailing and his Transpac record. So stay with us, we've got a great show, and let's go meet Roy. And you can see behind me, we've just traveled up to Burbank, California, to the Walt Disney Company Studios. And we're going to go inside and meet a very avid sailor who happens to be Roy Disney. So let's go inside. Oh, we've got a special treat for you today. Most of you probably recognize the gentleman standing next to me. We're up in his office right now on the Disney Studio lot. This is Roy Disney. Roy? It's Fine. nice to be here. Thank you for having the boat. Nice house. to have you here, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great office you have, very nautical theme. Yeah, well, we've been sailing for a long time, and you can't help but collect pictures and stuff of your boat, you know. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff in here as well, but uh, I, I like to make people walk in the door and say, oh, you sail. Exactly. So then I got five minutes of conversation taken care of right away. I don't think most people know that you're a very avid boater. We've been sailing uh, in our family since uh, the late 50s, I guess, and starting with a small boat, and, and as all sailors do, you know, the boats gradually, as years go exactly. by, get bigger and bigger and bigger. And you've sailed most of the local races, the Ensenada race? Uh, We've sailed around California and a little bit down to Mexico to Ensenada for many, many years before we started doing longer races. And now you're doing the big races. Well, I always wanted to do Transpac. Transpac was kind of the, the way out there ideal thing that, that the romantic trip to make, you know, sail to Hawaii. A uh, dear friend of mine that I worked with for many years, who was the best man at our wedding in 1955, had been on the 51 Transpac. And he came home with these great stories of, of the race, you know. He was on a little 35-footer, and it took him 18 days to get there. <laughs> But uh, it was, you know, just a, a romantic ideal all my life. And it's a long way. People don't understand the distance to Hawaii. I just brought a boat back from Honolulu. It took nine days. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a nice short trip. And there's nowhere to stop. But sailing, yeah. uh, now your boat, though, however, when you broke the record that we'll talk about in a minute here, you took ten days? Seven and a half days. Seven and a half. Is, so is you the present record that we set in 99. Wow. And that was on what boat? And that was on the present Piwacket. It's the third of three boats by that name that were all ultralight uh, downwind sleds that were essentially designed to do well in Transpac. And uh, when you sail that, do you sail straight across or do you go uh, run lines or the great well, arc? there's a big high pressure area in the northeast Pacific called the Pacific High, which sort of sits offshore, the center of it basically offshore from Washington, Oregon coastline. And the uh, revolution of air around that high is what produces the trade winds that blow you to Honolulu. However, it's right in between you and Honolulu, no matter where you start from. So you've got to go below it or you'll sail into the high itself, which is an area of, of either little or no wind at all. So the, the strategy of the race really is about how close you can come to sailing a straight line without sailing into areas where the winds are light. Let's talk about Transpac. Now, Transpac leaves 
From San Pedro. From uh, just off San Pedro, Point Furman. And then it finishes right off of? It leaves Catalina Island to port. It's the only mark of the course. That's 25 miles out. Right. And it finishes right off Diamond Head in view of Waikiki Beach and, <laughs> and the sound of ukuleles, you know, and the whole thing. And how many nautical miles when it's, you do your uh, course? Because you're not doing a straight line. The Great Circle distance is 2,225 miles. We will generally sail anywhere from 20 to 350 to as much as 24 or 500, because uh, sometimes the high will move way south, and the best course can be way out of the way, but it's in the breeze. So you can add on a couple hundred miles. Easily. Oh, yeah. boy. Yeah. <laughs> and how fast does your boat uh, average? Well, we averaged, when we broke the record in 99, we averaged just short of 13 knots for the so race. That's a great speed. That's going. That's really moving. Uh, and towards the end, the breeze came up, and we went through the finish line actually doing 24 on the speedometer and uh, in 33 knots of wind. And it was a thrill. And we actually were wondering how we were going to get stopped. When it <laughs> <laughs> now, you broke the record, and you've got a video about that, I believe. We have. The video is actually uh, a, a history of the Transpac race which is now the oldest continuously run yacht race in the world. It began in 1906. Uh, king David Kalakaua, who was a very forward-looking Hawaiian king in, who died in the 1890s, had suggested this race as a way to bring tourism to Hawaii. And it didn't happen until finally in 1906. Uh, but the first race attracted three boats. They started from San Pedro and went across. And so the first elapsed time record got set at about 12 and a half days. Uh, and people have been sailing it ever since, every other year. The only thing that stopped it were the two wars. Now, there's different classes for the race. The, the generally, uh, well, for a long time, uh, whoever had a boat could go, really? you know. Okay. Uh, but they did start developing handicap rules. And, and, and generally speaking, it was just if you were bigger, you got less handicap. Uh, but the, 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 that system has gotten more and more complex now. But generally, 35 feet is kind of the smallest boats that have been allowed in the race. Although we had a couple double-handers go over this last time that were uh, about 30 feet. Really? One of, them, one of them sort of lost his radio about at the start, and we worried about him for a long time. But he got there. Yeah, tell us about your boat a little. Now, now with the new technology come on, do you have email and... Uh Sat nav all the way across, of course. We GPS have, of course, uh, GPS, which has been with us now for quite a while and, and has become uh, just a really wonderful way to race because you just have you can stop worrying about where you are and worry about where you're going. Exactly. You know, because of GPS, uh, we are not allowed to get updated weather information once we lose leave the beach. Oh, really? So there's certain things with with both email and the web that are not allowed to us. One of these days we're going to have to change that because it's gotten so much easier to do and affordable for everybody. Uh, one of the reasons a lot of systems have been uh, outlawed it was, it was basically that they're expensive and some guys can afford them and some guys can't, so you like to keep the race even exactly. that way. But we do everything else we can think of, of course. <laughs> we have, as our navigator, a guy named Stan Honey, who I think is the premier navigator in the world, who really sent us the right way in 1999 because he's not only a great sailor and a great navigator and an electronics wizard, but he's a great weatherman to boot. And this is, it really is a race about weather. And with the, the GPS and everything going on, the tactician then can really get a feel for what's going on with the navigator. You yeah, run a tactician yeah. and a navigator, or are they the same person? Well, the crew is the tactician, basically. We've all done this race a bunch <laughs> of times. There, there's no rookies on our boat. Uh, so we've all sort of been there and done it and have a sense of what's ahead of us and what, what at least what we know has happened in the past. Uh, but, but Stan is really good at telling us where the, the, the best place to be is going to be two days from now and where we need to be. Aimed. Now, are you allowed to use autopilot at all underway? No, no. Can't use any autopilot? No, I think the, the single-handers get to do that. It's all um, guys steering the boat and guys trimming the sails by muscle power. There's no automatic winches or any of that. Good old-fashioned racing. It's, it, it is racing, and, and it's, it is a yacht, so you've got to do the hard stuff. How many crew do you carry? Because you'd have to be in have, ships, naturally. We actually, when we broke the record in 97, which was on this boat, um, we had nine on board, 
on a 70 foot boat and that's that's fairly minimal we went with 12 on a new boat uh, last time because we weren't real sure you know how many more people we needed for this bigger more powerful boat and we're going with 11 this year because we think we'll be a little bit lighter and just as efficient so when does everyone start getting fatigued um, <laughs> the first so 36 hours are the, are the tough ones uh, largely because you're going, going going kind of upwind into the seas and, right. and usually in a lot of breeze with a reef and a three or something. So you're kind of getting beat up for a while and nobody is real hungry. Yeah, you especially know. to get past Sam. And, and in fact, <laughs> last night's meal may, may well have been left out behind uh, at some point. There's a lot of seasickness that first night. Well, I find some of the roughest seas here is between Catalina and San Nick, San Nicolas Island. Yeah, and that's the water that uh, really kind of gets to everybody. You get beyond Catalina kind of at dusk usually, so the last piece of land you're going to see until you get to Hawaii is disappearing behind you into the darkness, and the wind is picking up at the same time, and the seas are getting bigger. Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, nervousness, let's say, <laughs> or just fear, depending on how new you are to it. Stay tuned as the Boathouse will be right back. Welcome back while we chat with Roy E. Disney at his office in Burbank. And the video, what are you, what are you showing the video actually then? Originally we thought, thought about making little segments that could be used in sports programs on TV to kind of promote the race. And when we asked the membership for, to send in their old historic film, we just got totally deluged with this stuff. I mean, we had 150 hours of film to go through. A lot of it really interesting historical footage. And then Leslie went out and did interviews, 300 hours worth of interviews, with everybody we could find that, do it, that had made the race and wanted to talk about it. So out of that, we made a, a, a film that's called uh, 100 Years Across the Pacific, the, the story of the Transpac. Well, tell us something exciting that happened either in the video or outside the video you've experienced out there on the Transpac? Well, there's, there's so much. We decided not to make it one of those boring historical movies <laughs> that just goes, well, in 1910, this would happen, exactly. you know, and things. So we sort of divided it up into subject matter, and there's, there's one on men, uh, men overboard problems, for instance. Um, in 1951, uh, a guy named Ted Sirks went off a big 60-footer that was out 800 miles from Hawaii, and they had a spinnaker up, and they were going pretty fast, and the, and the lifelines broke. And he went over, and by the time they got themselves stopped and went back, they'd lost him. He had a life ring. Somebody had thrown him a life ring. But it was one of those, he was really actually lucky to be a skinny guy, because it was one of those old-fashioned things they used to have around swimming pools. Right, right. You know, and he was skinny enough to be able to stick his arms and shoulders through it. And he floated there for 39 hours before they found him. He was down the warm waters then? We think heaven, yeah, in, in relatively warm water. And uh, I guess he said at least that he was kicking sharks away and so on. <laughs> um, but they did find him. The Navy used to accompany the race in those days. And there was a, a Navy destroyer out there. And they did the classic you know, search pattern right. through the area. And they were turning to go back and give it up. And there he was, two guys saw him. Oh, it's great. So it, th that was an enormously dramatic thing, and a little bit of it was documented on film. And a lot of his arrival in Honolulu uh, was documented as well. And of course, you know, his story from cocktail party to cocktail party got better and better <laughs> and better. Yeah, the ending story is probably the best. <laughs> yeah, the last, the last night, you know, he was fighting off the knife whales. And and <laughs> But, but it's, it's stories like that. We, our notion was not to make a film about boats, but to make a film about the people. So these are all stories about people, little stories, human interest stories. There's a whole section on women who have raised the trans back, uh, which, you know, in the early days was kind of frowned upon. That's correct. And these days, days of course, were delighted. Uh, we had a boat uh, two races ago, I guess it was, that was sailed entirely by guys with AIDS. And the new AIDS medicines were kind of coming along then, and people were beginning to get back to their careers. And they chartered a 60-footer and went out and raced this thing, scared themselves all witless. But they got in, and it was, I mean, it was the, one of the more heartwarming things I've ever been around. It was, it was fabulous. That, that's a big challenge. So that's a great story. There's a, 
you know, and this trans pack is actually a, a full of those kinds of stories of heroism, uh, sometimes of boredom, a lot of humor because we, you know, we really do have a lot of fun out there. Oh, you've got to, got to keep the morale up with the crew. Yeah. Who is the morale officer on your boat? Um, <laughs> Uh, they, 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 when one guy goes sour, we all we're all over him. Exactly. <laughs> it doesn't happen though. It, it's a lot easier to get a sour guy when you're not winning the race. But one of the things I think that people are enormously interested in when we run is the very first segment, which is the the beginning history of Transpac and how it got started and some of the people involved uh, and how much uh, brandied cherries they used to bring along <laughs> on those big old boats, you know. Exactly. Uh, one of them, the guy who actually sailed over from Hawaii to, to get the race started, who was a Hawaiian sailor, uh, got lost on the way home and thought uh, the Hawaiian Islands had sunk. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was just bad navigation. You know. <laughs> and they're easy to miss if you're going across. Uh, not with GPS actually, now, now it's great because you follow the jet trails. I know that come across. I always do. Yeah. I was on course. I see yeah. the jets. Yeah, it's pretty neat because you can just look up and say, even at night, you see these little <laughs> blinking lights going over. You know. And how do you, you know? A lot of people are probably curious. How do you get your boat back from Hawaii? It, 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 they sail them home. Uh, everybody does. It's usually sailed by another crew than the racing crew, partly because the guys don't have time, and partly because it's another kind of of sailing than racing. Right. Delivery. Deliveries are for guys who have more time who uh, understand that you can be two days late and it doesn't matter as long as you're home in one piece when you get home, you know. And and basically you shorten sail a lot to, to not damage the boat. Exactly. You want to take care of the boat. Uh, because the first three days at least, if not four or five, out of Honolulu is generally due north into the prevailing seas and the prevailing winds before you begin to get around the top of this high, this high pressure area that right. governs the, that part of the Pacific. What's the biggest seas you've been in? Oh, in the Atlantic, I don't know. They were 35 or 40 feet down off Florida one time. How'd the boat handle that? Pound a lot, or it pounds a lot. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. we were trying to go into it. Of course, you never get big winds like that when you're trying to go the, that <laughs> direction. Uh, we did a race from Spain uh, in, in 1992 that was commemorating Columbus's 500th anniversary. So uh, the Spanish government had sponsored this thing, and it was in December. And it was one of those big storms that blows up out of the Caribbean and up into New England. And we had, I know I saw 65 knots on the wind speed a few times. And uh, a couple of times it just turns around and headed us back to Spain. There was no other choice, you know, yeah, that's, that's going nasty. 20 knots the wrong way, <laughs> the wrong way in a race. Now, if you come in in seven days, like when you broke your record, another boat may not, or the last boat may not be coming for a week behind you. It was a good week, I think, this last time between the start. The, and even though they started the little boats several days ahead of the big boats, we tried. To, we have tried to bunch them up by doing staggered starts. And sometimes it. Sometimes the the little boat gets there ahead of you. You know, if it's a windy year. Uh, but if it's a light year, you know, you'll pass the guy in a day and a half, and, and it's almost like it's starting from scratch. And exactly. Well, right. I really appreciate you. Letting us come up here and interview you. Oh, I'm uh, I'm delighted to have you, and uh, I'm uh, I'm delighted to give everybody a chance to look at our film because it's it really is interesting. It's it's not as I say so much a film about boat racing as it is a film about people. Great! I can't wait to see it, and we're going to show the clips for all you viewers out there. And this is a special treat for you. And thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Great to be here. Great to have you here. Well, thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you. Stay tuned as The Boathouse will be right back. Welcome back to The Boathouse TV Show with Captain Mike. And we've got enough time for one email question. Mary Light of South Carolina writes, I have heard that you can get children's life jackets for a day, but to whom do you contact? My kids are teenagers now, but sometimes I have guests who may bring their children and I only have adult life jackets. Well, there's a great new program now from Boat US. As a matter of fact, go to www.boatus.com and look up the Loner Life Jacket Program. Matter of fact, I have a couple of them here. Throughout the nation, Boat US has joined forces with other companies and sheriff's department, harbor patrol departments to actually give out children life jacket loaners for a day. 
So go on the website and find out who gives them out. Now it's pretty neat. They're just children's jackets. Here's a small one here for a regular child, but they also have the new infant jacket, and this is kind of exciting. The new infant jacket actually has the head piece that sits behind the head with the hand strap. So if the infant falls in the water, you can simply reach down and be able to grab this hand strap and get them out. It's a great program. It's across the country. Again, go to BoatUS.com and look at where it is in your area, and be sure to always have one life jacket per person in the proper weight and size on board your vessel, and children and infants should always wear their life jackets. Our thanks go out to Roy E. Disney for allowing us to come to his office on the Disney Studio lot in Burbank, California, and also to Leslie of Channel C TV for allowing us to use footage from the Transpac video that she put together with Roy. As a matter of fact, any of you out there would like to order a copy of the Transpac video, either in VHS or DVD, please come to our website at BoathouseTV.com, and we do have a link there. Just click on Now Airing, and we'll put you directly in contact with Leslie. Also, I hope you've enjoyed the email question we had. Boat US has a wonderful program for loaning children's life jackets out to boaters so that no one ever goes out on a vessel without a life jacket for the child. And check the laws in your state, because many states, children have to wear their life jackets while they're underway. Keep sending me your email questions. Let me know what you think of the Boathouse TV show. My email is Mike at BoathouseTV.com. Our website, once again, BoathouseTV.com. And I'll see you next time on the Boathouse TV show. I'm your host, Captain Mike Whitehead. This episode of The Boathouse was brought to you in part by Stack Accountancy Corporation and by the MC Whitehead Company.